Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 9 through 15. This is the opening chapter of Mark, Mark being thought to be one of the, the oldest of the four Gospels. And it's in three short vignettes, each having a title, and I'll give the title as we go. First, the baptism of Jesus. <clears throat> In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. Then comes a temptation of Jesus. And the spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. And finally, the beginning of the Galilean ministry. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe in the good news the gospel of the lord god's people say praise to you O christ the first three gospels matthew mark and luke share same kind of basic outline jesus begins his public ministry in conjunction with john the baptist calls disciples teaches and heals confronts the Pharisees, dies on the cross, and is raised from the dead. Yet each gospel has its own distinctive understanding of Jesus and his divine role. Each has its own way of presenting the story. Well-known commentator Barbara Brown Taylor points out that Mark's gospel, the one we just read from, does everything quickly. His account of Jesus' first public appearance that we just read is no exception. If Mark's version was the only telling of these three short stories we had, we would miss some of what we think are critical elements. For, for example, if Mark's story were the only one we had, we would know nothing about John the Baptist's attempt to make Jesus the baptizer instead of himself. Remember his attempts to be subservient to Jesus? We get that from Matthew. In Mark's version of Jesus' wilderness time, we would have no debate between Jesus and the devil. That comes in Matthew and Luke. Flashing through the story, as Mark does, in seven sparse verses that we just read, we have flash one, Jesus is traveling from Nazareth to the Jordan River. Flash to scene two, he is in the wilderness. And finally, flash three, John's arrest has occurred. Now, we could spend time on each of these flashes and do it other times, basically by using other gospels. But today, let's follow Mark's lead. I accept that Mark stitched these episodes together at a rapid pace for a reason. Mark's organizational point is there in verse 15, where he says, the kingdom of God has come near. This is Mark saying you should be required to consider this for your immediate attention. Yes, we have had previous covenants, the covenant of Noah with the promise that God would never wipe out the world again that we read in our Old Testament reading, the covenant of Abraham to have many descendants, the covenant of Moses to protect God's chosen people Israel, the covenant of David to have kingly leadership in his line. All covenants for which people we're not able to maintain. Now we have a new covenant with God incarnate, God in human form through Jesus, 
it is announced in the Gospels, the covenant around which the rest of Jesus' words and deeds revolve, nearness of the kingdom of God brings a sense of urgency. In Mark, God's kingdom is mentioned 14 times, characterizing it as coming, its peculiarities, to whom it belongs, and impediments to its entry. God's kingdom turns out not to be a place, but a power. It's God's dynamic power to put right what is wrong in the world. It's Mark's sense of urgency that we are to respond to that shows through in his form of the gospel message. Mark is right, Mark writing does move quickly. But our thought should not move too quickly. If we rush through, we miss the momentous echoes from Israel's past in each of these flashes. We should not miss the clues to the character of the kingdom that has come near embedded in each of these flashes. Mark would want no less. In flash one, Mark starts with Jesus coming from Nazareth for baptism by John. Emerging from the Jordan, Jesus saw the heavens tore open. This is a classic apocalyptic end time image. This image signifies divine disclosure. The spirits descent upon literally into Jesus recalls the prophet's promise that Israel would be restored by the spirit in the last days. Jesus hears God's voice saying to him, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the scriptural embrace interweaving three Old Testament scriptures coming from the Psalms, Genesis, and Isaiah. Mark would not want us to miss the full picture here. Jesus' arrival is tied directly to the scripture and to the tradition. In our second flash, the character of the kingdom is illuminated as Jesus is immediately pushed by the spirit into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation. We are to recall the wilderness as a place of both on the one hand grueling testing, and on the other hand, divine deliverance. It all begins in the wilderness. Wilderness as the home to the prophets of Israel and to Israel itself for 40 years of wandering. Jesus too will be there. His meeting with Satan's temptations witnessed by no human creatures. He has with he is, was with the beast. The wild beast could be threats or might themselves be threatened or may have been tamed by Jesus' presence. We simply do not know in, about the beast in Mark's short account. But what this does tell us is that it is not the nation of Israel who takes on the mission of proclaiming God's reign. God's reign is at hand, as Isaiah would have understood it. It is Jesus. Jesus, under the Spirit's protection, stands at the center of God's inbreaking kingdom as both the beneficiary at his baptism and the wrestler at this temptation. We see in this second flash a new covenant has begun. <clears throat> Our third flash, in that third flash, the phrase now after John was arrested <clears throat> is not a throwaway phrase. We see here foreshadowed of what will happen for Jesus. Jesus like John will be betrayed, arrested and handed over. Like John, he will die by the hand of a weak puppet monarch who is simply a pawn in the scheme of others. Jesus came to Galilee 
proclaiming the good news and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The kingdom proclaimed by Jesus clashes with, with and against mortal principalities and powers that do not gracefully yield to God's governance. This flesh shows us a new kind of kingdom and king. I think this text from Mark is a really interesting choice by the lectionary for the first Sunday in Lent. In its closing is a premise and instructions. The premise is the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. And the instruction is repent and believe in the good news. This time of Lent, the 40 days before Easter, has long been associated with penance, self-denial, and self-sacrifice. That does suit Jesus' preparation for his own sacrifice. Jesus' path will receive considerable focus in the coming Sundays between now and Easter. But preparation for sacrifice is truly more appropriate the focus of passion or Easter week, leading the week leading up to Easter. <clears throat> the church has sometimes expended, extended the mood of Passion Week to create six weeks of grieving and self-deprivation, a classic giving up for Lent. Mark's quick pace can send us in a different direction. Mark tells us the time is fulfilled. The cup is already full. The cup overflows. What joy we can experience. Perhaps Mark would have us think of Lent being to Easter as Advent is to Christmas, a time of joyous preparation. God, through Jesus, has already set things in motion. As we approach the end of the season, things will go into overdrive. As with Advent, also with Lent, Mark would have us hear his words and respond at this time, though, with joy. Hear his word, repent, and believe the good news. Now, repentance is too often thought of as feeling miserable over our sins or regretting that we haven't been more religious, haven't been to church enough, haven't been praying enough. With this, we get hung up in the Old Testament prophet's concept that repentance is beyond human powers. We look forward to the time when God will perform some miracle upon us, or we are, have done enough sacrifice that God would be about raising men from the valley of the dry bones. Through Mark, Jesus tells us, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news of the gospel. Repentance is no longer a demand for God's action. Repentance is a possibility for all, all humankind. Now, in Jesus, repent, repenting means to turn away from sin and back to God. Repentance through Jesus is completed by faith. Return to God is no longer just a response to the law, but response to a person. It is discipleship to Jesus. Jesus points to himself as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That's taken care of. Repentance and faith are now linked together. There can be no genuine repentance, which is not also the acceptance of the divine promise spoken in Jesus of Nazareth, acceptance by faith. Faith is in the message. Faith is in the acceptance in the good news of Jesus. Mark's gospel put before us God's own beloved son. Mark has announced clearly what is going on because the time is fulfilled. 
Mark recognizes that hearers, even the disciples, will misunderstand. Others will be misunderstood. Some will simply give up. Yet, if we follow through with Mark, it becomes even clearer that there is indeed good news, and that yields the yields of discipleship, as he describes it, discipleship will be that some seed planted brings forth as much as a hundredfold. Mark tells us you can find that. To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, he says. During Lent, perhaps our attention should not be on what we give up. Perhaps we can focus our attention on the kingdom that Jesus shows among us. I'm going to suggest that one way to do this is to make a goal to read through the Gospel of Mark during this Lenten period. Make this your Lenten commitment. Mark is 16 chapters. So in the six weeks of Lent, allowing for a little slippage, maybe set a goal of three chapters per week. So maybe it becomes your Monday, Wednesday, Friday routine to read three chapters of Mark. Just to make it interesting, I'm going to suggest you do this on the computer <clears throat> using a website called BibleGateway.com. The site is listed below on your bulletin below the sermon title today. And I, as a teacher, will declare that you will get extra credit if you do this through a translation that you may not have otherwise read. Maybe you even want to try more than one translation for your reading. I happen to like uh, the message, which is a modern language translation, and the common English Bible translation is another one that I find helpful as well as uh, NRSV, our new Revised Standard Version that we're familiar with. <clears throat> this site is simply amazing. It has like 230 versions of the Bible in 70 languages. I really encourage you to check out BibleGateway.com. I'm going to close with three versions of Mark's closing statement from the New Revised Standard. Now, after John was arrested, <clears throat> Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. From the message translation, we hear, after John was arrested, <clears throat> Jesus went to Galilee preaching the message of God, saying, time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. And third, from the Common English Bible translation, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. Believe the good news, believe the message, trust the good news. Amen.